dear ladies and gentlemen good evening to all hope you can hear me well you all are welcome to the online workshop on today and tomorrow of billing automation systems local and global context so let me to introduce me first i am engineer prasanna narangode the chairman of billing services engineering sectional committee of the institution of engineers sri lanka so well known as iesl i'll give a brief introduction about iesl and billing services engineering sectional committee so iesl is the apex body of engineering in sri lanka and set up way back in 1906 it's about 115 years now all practicing engineers in sri lanka are members of isl and there are and there are more than 20000 members currently enroll enroll in isl in different member categories isl is serving its membership through several sectional committees so billing services engineering sectional committee is one of such committees which serves the billing services engineering sector in sri lanka in addition to its general mandate the billing services committee is conducting frequent webinars public lectures knowledge sharing sessions and workshops to uplift the knowledge of members and engineers in the industry so today also we are conducting another such event getting well experienced and eminent four panel members onto the isl online platform so with that a small note let's move back to the topic and agenda of the workshop today why we selected this topic you know that the billing sector is continuously growing all over the world and is currently responsible the billing services sector is responsible for more than 40% of global energy and significant contributing to the contributing to the overall carbon emissions to the environment sri lanka is also in a development phase and there would be more high rise buildings in near future especially with the planned port city projects so it's a non fact and found that the billing automations or rather we call billing management systems can easily save 10 to 15% of energy in the billing sector which should be a significant contribution to reduce the carbon footprint or emission to the environment so it's timely important to discuss this about this topic and subject and improve our knowledge on how to be benefited from billing automation so that's why we all are here today to get that knowledge and get that experience of our panel members shared with us all you know also you know new technological developments such as iot 5g and artificial intelligence etc and modern trends and demand of various sectors are making a significant challenge to the billing automation field and it's very prudent for all of us to be aware about the near future technologies and challenges also another reason to select in this topic is very important reason do our engineers are capable of designing implementing and operating of bmss we have a doubt we have still a doubt whether we are getting the maximum benefits of it so we need to discuss this very openly so nothing to hide and we need to take up these matters very openly and discuss to improve our knowledge and skills of designing implementing and operating of pms in order to get the maximum benefit of that so these are the major reasons behind of this topic selection and the background of this workshop today so without taking too much time 
So let me introduce our panel members first and then move into the into the workshop. So our panel members, there are four experienced and eminent panel members with us here today to share their knowledge and experience. Mr. Philips Wellman, joining from German. Mr. Wellman is, is Mr. Wellman is studies, he studied business administration and engineering for energy technologies, worked across different countries in Asia, China, Philippines and Hong Kong. Working for Dios since eight years now. He started his career as a sales engineer, developed the overall business in Asia with offices in Hong Kong, Singapore and Melbourne. So lived for more than four years in Hong Kong as a general manager of Dios Control Lady. So now Mr. Wellman is back in Germany looking after international business, mainly Asia and Middle East. As well, he's building up our new business unit for IoT and cloud solutions. So thank you, Mr. Wilmont, for joining with us today. So number two, Mr. Mohammed Sharif Ibrahim. So 13 plus overall experience, out of which 11, year, 11 plus years in BMS, in various roles with various controller brands. Example, Distech, Bekoff, Honeywell, JCI. And now he's in Dios from last five years. Experience in various roles, such as commission engineer, project engineer, so design solution architect of projects, and now general manager working as a general manager in Middle East. He's joining with us from Middle East today. Ms. Sairi Sumatiarachi is a BAC engineering, electrical, electrical engineering from the University of Moratua, graduated from the University, University of Moratua. The postgraduate diploma in industrial automation from University of Moratua. Eight plus years experience in ELV and BMS. Senior electrical engineer, currently working at Demo Private Limited. So last but not least, very experienced engineer, Indra, Mr. Indradeva Mendes. He's worked as general manager in facilities management in World Trade Center, Colombo. So more than 25 years in experience, graduated from the University of Moratua in electronics, and he is possessing an MBA in business management of technology. So this, there are, the, there are four panel members today. I'm sure that they are very much capable of handling this event. And to answer your questions at the end of the session, at your expected level. So the, our moderator, engineer Jagat Vikramasekara, also another very experienced, eminent engineer, is working in, the, working in the industry more than 13 years in this BMS and ELD field. So he has got his first degree from University of Moratua in electrical engineering and postgraduate diploma in industrial automation from the same university, University of Moratua, currently serving as a consultant in BMS and ELV in Sri Lanka. And also is serving as a visiting lecturer for ELV subjects, such as building automation systems, attached various organizations, such as University of Moratua, Institution of Engineers Sri Lanka, and Green Building Council of Sri Lanka, CEDA, Construction Industry Development Authority, etc. So it's a well experienced uh, engineer. That is a pleasure to get the engineer Jagat as a moderator into this workshop today. So thank you very much, sirs and madam, for your presence here and your willingness and acceptance of our invitation 
to share your knowledge and experience with the audience today. Thank you very much once again. So last, before moving to the workshop, there are two important messages to give you. That there will be a Q and A session at the end of the at the end of the session. So please keep your all questions posted in the chat box. Our moderator will take them up with the panel members at the end of the session. So you can post, you can keep your all questions to the chat box, Zoom chat box. So we will collect them and take up with the panel members at the end of the session. Also kindly keep your mics mute mode to minimize the background noise. So thank you very much, Engineer Jagat Vikramasekra, our moderator today. So please over to you to take the session from this point onwards. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Engineer Prasanna Narangoda, the uh, Chairman of uh, Building Services Engineering Section and Committee of uh, Institution of Engineers Sri Lanka. And uh, I'm very much uh, delighted to moderate this particular session today. And I'm um, uh, thinking and I believe that uh, we can share a very quality time uh, within this uh, two hours period. So uh, as our Chairman, Engineer Prasanna Narangoda highlighted, uh, there are lot of expectation behind this program. So uh, building automation system has been a vital component in building industry, especially in saving energy and providing some other aspect as well. Especially we have to understand the real capabilities that building automation system could do, especially when it comes to safety. Nowadays, that has been a big issue, considerable issue due to this uh, current uh, pandemic, providing the healthy environment within the building, as well as providing the security, uh, comfort and efficiency would be the key vital ingredients when it comes to a building in modern countries. So during this program, definitely we will be highlighting what are the developments that had happened out there by which how we can improve the, these aspects, especially safe, health and safety aspects, security, comfort, as well as efficiency, so on and so forth. At the same time, there's a huge challenge out there. As previous speaker highlighted, there are a lot of technologies are coming in. So can we implement them in Sri Lanka without any hesitation? Are we having sufficient infrastructure in order to accommodate them? So we have to analyze it carefully. As building automation system engineers, are we doing any lapses in our process? Are there any lapses? You know, we have design stage, implement stage, and testing and commission. Finally, we run the system. During this whole life cycle, are there any lapses in our engineering process, which might curtail the real benefit to the end user? Those things will also be discussed during these sessions. Uh, at the end, we will have a kind of a conclusion how we can manage this all for the betterment of our building automation system industry. So those are the aspects, ladies and gentlemen, today we hope to cover within this two hours period. At the same time, as previous speaker highlighted, what is happening in Sri Lankan building automation system industry? We do see that there are huge attention, enthusiasm, within the engineers when it's come to building automation systems. We want to implement it. So there are a number of organizations who are actively contributing to the development of this sector. There are more than 10 industries who are doing that. There are a number of products coming into our market. There's a very good trust from our client also on certain brands. The biggest challenge is how do we continue them? How we can provide the outcome as our client and the rest of the stakeholder expect. These are the challenges. So let's see. Today we have wonderful panel who can contribute us on this aspect, especially sharing their own experience and challenges that they have gone through during their career life. So my first question goes to engineer Mr. Indradeva Mendis who had been in the industry for a very long time. So, so would you like to talk about our industry, how it evolved, what do we see up to now? And 
especially during your uh, few decades of career life as the facility manager, what were the challenges you faced during this period? Would you like to share a few thoughts with us today? Okay, uh, Jagat, thank you very much for inviting me. Okay, uh, let me tell you a story. I think I'm good at telling uh, stories. So my uh, first interaction with the BMS was all the way back to mid nineties. As a just passed out engineer, I had to uh, deal with uh, a fully fledged uh, building management system with about, I think uh, 18 network controllers, 400 plus digital controllers, and altogether about 26,000 uh, objects mapped to the BMS system. So obviously you can think uh, when you have such a large BMS, it has to deal with a large set of uh, building services, uh, engineering equipment as well. So we had uh, 100 plus handling units, and then uh, about 150 plus uh, electrical circuit, uh, lighting circuits, and about, I think, good 200 plus ventilation and booster fans. So it's a huge uh, building services system. So our first challenge, my first challenge was uh, first to convince myself how to, uh, is this BMS is useful, right? Because uh, BMS was pretty new at that time to Sri Lanka. So, and then how to convince other people that BMS is useful. So then the first challenge, we looked at our equipment the first challenge came as how to start and stop them day in, day out, morning, evening. So we realized you cannot do it manually. Even if you use your computer, it's still difficult. So then we tried to find a solution. The first solution or the first usage of BMS came through uh, scheduling, time scheduling. So we started scheduling handling units with the fans, the light circuits. That was the basic uh, start of using BMS. Then the scheduling business uh, was developed as uh, we understood the building services, equipment, as well as the uh, BMS. We uh, improved uh, scheduling to accommodate the uh, seasonal variations. Right? And then we further improved it to optimize the uh, start stop of uh, equipment to save energy and reduce the operating cost. So that's how it was developed from scheduling. Then once the scheduling was done, our BMS operators start to get complaints from tenants, mainly about the air conditioning. Some people say it's too high, some say it's too low. So then uh, uh, he had a problem how to deal with this. So we have trained the BMS operator to understand the building services. And when you go through the, uh, the uh, parameters of the handling unit uh, with some training, he could uh, point out the fault or the defect or the deficiency of the particular air handling unit, let's say up to about 90% accuracy. Nine out of 10 times, he was right. So we have, didn't have much of a large uh, technical staff. And uh, then we could send a fairly uh, junior technician instead of sending a senior technician with a value-added instruction. Okay, you go and check this, this is the fault. And then, okay, that was done. But then it's what of a reactive situation because tenants start complaining, then only we, we act to that. Then we thought, okay, why don't we generate some alarms? For example, uh, airflow status, trip status, then the uh, filter status. So most of the uh, elements, we realize, okay, these are the parameters, say return air temperature. We set alarms, right? And then after setting the alarms, we used to get uh, pop-up alarms from various uh, HU systems and all that, mainly related to HVAC, so that we could even act more proactively even the before the tenant complaint comes. Right? So that you send somebody, or most of the time he correct the deficiency from the uh, BMS compute itself, so that tenant complaints went down, and the inter indoor air quality went up. So the people's uh, a working environment became more and more comfortable, more stable. As, as a result, we can say our HVAC system became more effective as far as the customers are concerned. The next challenge came, okay, now the effectiveness is there, but how about the efficiency? Because 
satisfying your customers continuously is okay, but at what cost? When then we started looking at the efficiency of our central air conditioning plant, and again need integration, so that we integrated the energy aspect of the system, and then various parameters of the chillers, condensed water pumps, chill water pumps, cooling towers, and finally we managed to monitor the uh, overall plant efficiency. Let's say water side separately, air side separately, online. So our not the engineers, not the building manager, but the supervisor grade and even technical grade, they start monitoring the uh, performance of the building manage uh, performance of the central AC plant. And finally, with certain retrofits uh, as well, we managed to bring down the water side efficiency of the central air conditioning plant to 0.69 kilowatt per ton. This is a 25 old building I'm referring to. So which is right. uh, in an uh, excellent uh, state of, uh, as far as the ASHRAE standards are concerned. So now uh, earlier we achieved the effectiveness, right? And now we have achieved the efficiency. That is through yes, the yes. BMA. So then with the support of people, and then that means when you satisfy your customers, that will add to your organization because you retain your customer. When you do it efficiently, you reduce the operating cost of the work. So either way, you are helping your organization to achieve their primary objective. Uh, just to uh, close up, I will give you one single example, uh, how you uh, analogous to like uh, building services or a building is analogous to a human, human body, right? Just like the, the other organs, limbs and all that, we have building services, right? The building management system is your brain and the central nervous system. So without the brain and the central nervous system, you cannot operate your organs properly. So then you may be asking me, where is the building operator or the building manager company? Is the mind, right? So human completed with the organs, uh, then the um, central nervous system, brain, and a well-trained, well-educated mind. We have all these three things satisfied, you will have a high-performing building. So that is the objective of an organization which is operating a building. Being uh, facilities managers and building operators, it is our duty to support these objectives. Wonderful, sir. thank you very much. Uh... I think uh, I really enjoyed that particular analogy you brought here, how this all the element uh, could be connected and then uh, you get the building automation system who is kind of the brain, who is governing this all the thing. No wonder uh, why, how you got this uh, particular fa facility awarded several times as one of the efficient building uh, in, in Colombo. Would you like to recall those memories as well, sir? Uh, yes, uh, yes, uh, Jagat, and we won uh the most energy efficient building award the four times, one in 1998, uh, 2010, 2012, and 2014. And not only that, then uh, it became the first uh, commercial building to become the, uh, uh, the gold rated green building in Sri Lanka. And then later, way back, uh, I think very uh, recently, it won the, uh, it became uh, ISO 50001 certified as, as a certified uh, building for energy management system. I think uh, that is the last uh, certification objective is to sustain the all the good work that it has been, the people uh, done put in to make the building energy efficient. Thank you very much. Sir. I think that's a true testimony how building automation system would contribute to the building, especially in terms of uh, customer satisfaction as well as energy efficiency uh, when those all factors are considered. Thank you very much. And yeah. now this is a remarkable system. There is no any any wonder. There is no any doubt behind that. Uh, but anything in this world always subjected to some sort of development. It's always evolving. So while we are developing and while we are getting this benefit within this uh, small tiny island, uh, Sri Lanka, we should also know that there are lots of things, not lots of developments happening out there. So it's our duty to grab these technologies, we should be aware. First, later we'll think whether it is applicable or not, but first we should be aware, we should know what is happening out there in terms of technological development. So in order to get this sound knowledge, changing, developing world, we want to know what is happening out there. So we got uh, one of our colleague here, uh, engineer Philips. Now I just want to know, uh, Philips, uh, 
in terms of this uh, building automation system development, what are the development that we can see in the current world? Especially we do see this uh, uh, IoT technologies are being spoken, uh, 5G in the verge of dominating this whole world. There are lots of software technological development like cloud technologies and all. What are the developments basically happening out there? Hey, Jagan, I hope you can hear me. Uh, first of all, thank you as well for the invitation and uh, greetings from Germany. Um, yeah, so we can say basically as a manufacturer of BMS systems, the, the capabilities of BMS systems these days are basically limitless. The technology is very much, much advanced, but it often is, uh, is misunderstood by the people who are using it and by the people who have to implement it. For example, I get asked very often um, what I'm actually doing for, for life, for work, and I'm explaining that I'm working in the BMS industry and people often, they, they don't know what is a BMS system. It's uh, because the BMS system is something which is you know, hidden behind walls. It's sitting in the basement, in the plant room, in, in switchboards. It's something you can't really see and feel like a switch, for example, or like a, like a nice looking socket, which of course the architects uh, like. And uh, this is also the reason why a BMS system is often not really properly used and properly uh, commissioned. So um, yeah, the BMS market is a very, very slow moving market. It's a very conservative market, um, which um, is of course on one side good because never change a running system. Uh, but on the other side, it's very hard to implement new technologies um, in the BMS industry. Because often you have maintenance contracts within the buildings which run for 10, 15, 20 years and systems are only renewed when they fail unfortunately. Um, this makes it um, quite tough, you can say, um, in the German European market, but also international markets um, to really implement new technologies. So um, yeah. for me, basically, uh, yes, go ahead, please. Yes. Yeah, for, for me, the main purpose of a BMS system is basically, uh, first of all, to uh, yeah, for the energy savings, to increase the energy savings within the building, but also to increase the comfort of a user. In the building. Um, these are for me the two main objectives that a BMS system has to achieve. And um, since BMS systems are the largest consumers of, uh, of energy, um, which we have currently these days, and account for about 40% of CO2 emissions, um, so there's huge potential uh, in buildings that we have to lift up basically through proper BMS systems to first of all increase the energy efficiency of these buildings. But more importantly these days, uh, buildings need to be interesting. Uh, you have younger generations, they want to have a, a nice, proper workplace. So buildings need to be interesting and you need to be able to interact with buildings these days. That's why um, we can see globally that um, some, some very nice, interesting first pioneer projects are coming in. For example, we have here in, in Germany, in Berlin, which is uh, the Cube. The Cube is currently one of the most energy efficient and smartest buildings that we have these days here in Europe. And you basically interact with this building only with a smartphone. So everything, what you do in the building, basically from uh, booking a parking space, from booking your office, through those flex desks, um, organizing food from the canteen, everything is done basically through the smartphone. And that building, yeah, it has a size of 19,000 square meters, which is, I would say, a medium-sized building. But there are more than 3,750 sensors basically built in this building. And um, through 750 um, Bluetooth beacons, this building basically um, yeah, tracks the position of the users of the building. It creates heat maps, heat maps of uh, the users of, of that building. Basically through the heat maps, it, uh, it's um, yeah, controlling the ventilation system. So it's a completely new thinking, how buildings will be ventilated in future. So this is currently one of the smartest buildings that we have here in, in, in Germany. And it's one of the smartest buildings that we have in Europe. Right, Philip, uh, let me ask a few few points there. I think you highlighted something really uh, amazing. Uh, based on the heat map, uh, you adjust the air conditioning system. You get the uh, presence of uh, uh, human, uh, the occupancy, and then you adjust the air conditioning performance. That's something really remarkable to know. And other than that, especially, I want to see uh, events come to the uh, business verticals. Now, in Sri Lankan context, we get a lot of officers. At the same time, you get a lot of... Uh, uh, residential buildings as well. that's that there are huge demand huge development in that sector so uh, how we can utilize our building automation system covering those areas yeah well i mean yeah building automation systems are, are yeah, primarily targeting of course large-scale buildings um, i'm talking about large office towers 
um, in the healthcare sector, you have, of course, hospitals, um, elderly homes, which you have there as well. And uh, a big market is, of course, also shopping malls. Um, I mean, these are the, the key targets for us as BMS manufacturers, of course. But uh, there are also certain applications which we see in the residential market. Um, there's, for example, a project which we did recently in the Philippines, where we had to monitor fire exit doors. And there was a building which was uh, fully developed already. But um, they always had people basically breaking into the building through the fire exit doors because you can't lock down the fire exit doors. So they had to implement a monitoring system for these fire exit doors. And uh, we used their wireless technology. We used an ocean sensors basically to monitor these fire exit doors. And um, yeah, so the building owner basically had full control of the fire exit doors and could see basically when a door was open. This could be yeah. um, one application, for example, for residential buildings. Yes, and Philip, uh, while you were explaining this, uh, you said that it was a building which was already running. So yes, there's right, a huge right. market for yeah, there's a huge market for this uh, retrofitting area. Even there'll be a lot of people, lot lot of uh, contractors, lot of building owners who who would be you know willing to have building automation system uh, in their facilities as well. But they would be wondering whether it will give real benefit or not. So anything that you can add uh, covering the retrofitting market as well in in building automation industry. Yeah, sure. I mean, the, the, the retrofit market is, is a very, very interesting market, um, especially also for us here in Germany, or let's say the, the more developed countries looking at Singapore, for example, Hong Kong, I mean, Europe in general, um, the buildings are there already. Uh, there's not too much space basically to develop new projects. And um, it's, it's a huge market to retrofit buildings. And therefore, one very important development are, are for me wireless technologies. So you don't have to pull any new wires um, through the buildings. You don't have to open any walls basically through this wireless sensors, and we're talking about, for example, LoRa, ZigFox, and ZigBee, uh, which are used very frequently, you are able basically to, to monitor the building and also to uh, control the building, since there's also wireless technologies for IO modules and even controllers these days. So um, that's why the, the retrofit market is going to be a very, very interesting market in the future, also especially due to Corona, since there's going to be some repurposing of office buildings, since people are people stay in home offices for, for a certain percentage of the week. So office towers are going to be repurposed. And we can see that basically the repurposement will be done basically according to new um, yeah, residential buildings. Yes, Philip, definitely we will be talking about this uh, pandemic-based, corona-based issues uh, as a you know separate segment. Definitely I'll get back to you on that. But before getting into the uh, next week, I would like to also get your opinion on this integration part because a few years back building automation system and rest of the systems were kind of isolated system but now we expect this all the system would be working as one coherent consolidated system so what do you think about like having cctv fire alarm system you know having a one uh, interface what is your opinion and what are the development uh, how we can be benefited out of it's that it's basically just just development in a time frame so we're starting basically with, with bms with local control and the bms is basically developing to the ibms integrated building management system that's basically what we call it these days and uh that's basically a full integration of all facilities within the building and um we as bms experts are basically the ones who come in at last into the building and basically the task is of course to fully integrate all those systems all those facilities into one system and um, it's for me just a, a logical consequence, basically, since systems need to interact with each other, we have to exchange data through systems, and therefore we need an integrated system. And also the controllers or the technology these days, and I'm talking about building management systems as a software, or the DDC controllers, um, they basically are capable of doing that these days. So that's right. just a logical consequence, basically, where the market is heading. Thank you very much, Philip. Thank you very much. And now, yes, of course, it it's gives you remarkable benefits. And uh, we, are, we have a lot of uh, living examples, living testimonies are there. But any industry, when you are trying to sell it, when you are trying to bring it to the real user, real owners, there are a lot of challenges that we are facing always. Any industry, because due to the technical development, that, that would give the best output. But how you get into the market, is end of the day relying on the people who are at the ground. How to convince your building owner to use, to purchase building automation system into your facilities. How to convince your consultant, how to convince your contractor. Those would be really challenging point. So we have another panelist who are capable of answering this side as well. My invitation goes to engineer uh, Sheriff Ibrahim. Uh, 
you have been in, in the industry for a very long time as a sales engineer, you know, convincing your client, potential client, your uh, consultant, building owners, maybe retrofitting aspects also would have covered. So how challenging was it when, when you try to approach the market for the first time? Would you like to share some experience, especially covering the Middle East market and uh, rest of the Asian countries? Invitation goes to engineer Sharif Ibrahim. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for uh, IES for conducting this and uh, having us on the on this show. Uh, yes, um, I've been involved in the Middle Eastern region for the last 11 years. Uh, been also handled a uh, few markets in the region of different priority levels. Uh, at the moment, unfortunately, we are all living in uh, cities where cities are fighting for the outdoor air quality, where, um, you know, um, depletion of all these uh, non-renewable energies, the traditional energy sources like um, you know, petrol, gases and everything. Also, the global alarming, global warming, which is rising in an exponential rate. Uh, these days, the global focal point would be like green energy, uh, environmental protection, uh, CO2 emission control. So these are all in place. So um, uh, in terms of uh, these things, buildings are contributing negatively a lot. Like as study says, 40% of the CO2 emissions are coming from the building globally. So how we are curbing this, how we are uh, uh, helping this for the global cost. Yeah, uh, this is one part of it. And then another part, buildings, each commercial building is constituted about accountable for like 40% of energy um, you know, consumption. So these are the two main issues we address. Also, these are the two main things what we communicate when I, when I approach the customer or the client. Um, as I said, I've been involved with the various marketers, few countries in the region with a different level of priorities and different levels of standards. Let's explore the low priority uh, countries where the two scenarios I'm going to, uh, I'm going to explore, like see one scenario, BMS will be on the stack. So it's just a sake of a uh, checklist or the selling point for the owner. Okay. Which the selling point for the owner means that they can sell the property for a higher price if they have a BMS, but that concept, I don't think it's a, it's a right concept. And the second one, a project which doesn't even want to willing to implement BMS. Uh, <clears throat> they want to take out the BMS when they are, they want to cut the budget. The first thing will go out from the list is the BMS. Uh, maybe the reason because uh, lack of knowledge. Uh, also, as Philip mentioned, it is hidden behind, not seen uh, upfront, fancy, no fancy things in that. Nobody knows what BMS controls are. And also they think it's an unnecessary spending. And for few people or few stakeholders, it's uh, BMS complicates construction. Yeah. So um, to solve these, uh, of course, uh, education, training, awareness has to be created. Communication has to be forwarded to the to the to the to the respective party. Um, so um, when, like the second scenario, when the client don't want to invest, uh, implement the BMS, or even in the both scenarios, sometimes they go with the bare minimum. Okay, so if that building needs to be monitored or controlled for 1,000 physical points, in the end up, they end up with 200, only 200 physical data points. And, and that's, they call it as a value engineering, but it's a false value engineering. So uh, as Mr. Indradeva said, whether we are using the BMS system for the fullest, when you get the BMS system, it's supposed to be for the 1,000 points and you get it for only 200 points, you're not, you're not getting it for fullest. So that's one point. So, uh, and also the BMS, it's not just start, uh, uh, it's not ends when you hand over the project. It start from, uh, from the day when it gets hand over to the customer. When the facility team comes in, where the real BMS starts, when you operate it for the next 20, 30 years, that's your key. That's your master key for the building. That's your master key to make your building more sustainable, more energy efficient, operational easiness. And it also brings a lot of business revenues, which I'm gonna, I'm gonna cover in the next. So uh, we all know, another factor is, we all know that all the facilities in, during the initial design, they design it for full occupants or 100% occupancy, but which is not the case. 
which is which will be never the case. And recent development like Corona, which even drastically reduced all the occupancy. So do we implement the right strategy in the building? So if we have implemented the right strategy in the building, the building could have easily controlled and easily adjusted based on the occupancy level. Uh, another thing. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, no, the uh, basically, uh, especially I do see, especially when it's come to the Asian market, uh, compared to the uh, rest of the world, um, when we are trying to convince, uh, especially this building automation system, as you said, sometime uh, in the name of value engineering, this would be the first thing that would go off from the BOQ. Why are we lagging here, in, in especially in Asia, when it's come to the Asian countries? Uh, what, what do you think? What could be the reason? Especially, you know, uh, sometimes this may be due to the, I don't know whether due to the specifications or uh, maybe the perception. Why Asia, if you consider Asia especially, why it is a little bit lagging? Um, yeah, there are many factors. Of course, um, what I really want to comment is our specifications are very old. Uh, our specifications like uh, we're still following the strategy from 1980s. There, the, during that time, no system, I mean, BMS system has not built for the energy efficiency. It is built for the right controls and uh, you know, thermal comforts or the you know, better comfort, not for the energy efficiency. Recently, it has been changed. The things has been changed, alarming global warming, the CO2 emissions, everything. Everyone wants the building more efficient as possible. So this is where the authority and regular, regulator, I mean, some regulators comes into the picture. Some institution has to come into the picture. Because if you, if you compare, the, if you take the example of fire alarm, CCTV, this is a must in a building. You cannot, whenever you're doing a, a, a you know, budget cut or the value engineering, you cannot remove these two because this is a re regulation from the government. And it says fire alarm is a help and safety, life safety equipment, and your uh, CCTV is security. But for the, when it comes to the BMS, it's the same. So we don't have that you know, uh, uh, freedom uh, that is one case. Also, uh, price, of course, um, low price stuff, uh, which wins over everything. So whenever you get a very low price systems, um, you might not get that greater benefits, which I'm going to cover in the during the course of the discussion. So I will I will I will share an example where my interaction with one of the client, where there was a BMS system. Actually, he was they were building a building which is for their own internal business purposes. It, was, it can be their office or something like that. And uh, during the tender and everything is awarded during the later stage of the meeting, they were deciding to cut some budget. So first thing they want to remove is the BMS or to spend bare minimum. So the reason it was like, I was part of that uh, discussion. The reason was like, uh, they are not willing to spend money on this. Okay, this is an additional expenditure. So I have to come up with a point. Actually, this is not a, you're not spending, you're investing. And this investment gives you a great deal of value after the installation. These values can be seen as a money, direct money, energy savings, reduced manpower, ease of the building operation, fully automated building, fault detections, even direct business revenue, since it is your own office, it's direct business revenue to, 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 to yourself. And Data analysis, it collects all the data from the building. And for the future, if you want to do the data analytics, you have all the data. So to, to justify this, I have to come up with the five points where um, these five points are directly proportional to each other or correlated to each other. And these are first point will be thermal comfort. Second will be occupant health. Third will be increased labor productivity or the increased business revenues. Fourth will be energy efficiency, I mean, higher energy efficiency. And fifth will be better cost. So uh, thermal comfort. Thermal comfort is nothing but with the proper um, temperature control and well-maintained indoor air quality, which triggers HVAC equipment to give desired cooling or the desired heating. So this gives a most comfortable environment for the occupant. We all know that one or other way we are occupant or the business owners. Yeah, we will, work, we will be working in some, some workspaces. Okay, so we are the occupant. We'll be owning an apartment or we'll be owning a house. So we are, we are right. the owners right. some other day. So um, uh, 
this way we have to we have to change our attitude this way we have to think like and also like for example if you get a project which is a government offices government office okay and you are implementing a system and uh, when the design comes in and everything you don't design it properly because you say okay i need to win the project for the lowest price i don't want to put xyz stuffs i don't want to keep the demand ventilation uh, demand control ventilation i don't want optimal start and everything okay let's keep it very simple but the problem is even though you're not living in that building even though you're not working in that building at least in a month you might be spending an hour in that building for some documentation purpose or something so you're partially you're also part of that environment so imagine you are spending one hour or few hours you still expose that environment which you have built which is that so uh, our you know psych psychological thinking or the philosophy has to change a little bit all of us we are all responsible for this so thermal comfort uh, this is pretty easy things when it's all programmed Wonderful. yes yeah thermal comfort is which is all programming stuff algorithm your control philosophy so you it's like a puzzle yeah bms inside a building is like a puzzle we have temperature we have air flow we have relative humidity we have uh, these are all physical um, we have co2 these are all physical variable and we have personal variable like our clothing level or metabolic rate so when we solve this puzzle and we put it in uh, we, we, we organize this into one structure and that's your algorithm and that gives you the maximum output and that's optimize your building and gives you a comfortable environment to live okay thank you okay. and thank the second yeah, yeah. Uh, sheriff i will get back to you on actually there are lots of parameters definitely we can discuss uh, how we can convince uh, these all the stakeholders at the end of the day but i really like uh, especially the uh, point you, which you highlighted like the old specifications still i'm seeing even in uh, sri lankan context also a lot of specification they are kind of outdated document and uh, at the same time you highlighted the building automation system start really start from the day you hand over the system to the uh, the owner of the facilities so those are really interesting point and i would like uh, to highlight the fact that you uh, mentioned building automation system as an investment it's not a system based it's an investment so let let me uh, get back to you again uh, on these all the uh, pictures here and what are the other element of uh, you know convincing these people but before that i want to know what is happening in the grassroots level uh, especially even though we design them all together we get all the controller but we have to have one engineer one person who goes to the industry who goes to the site and uh, you know implement them uh, connect them together in you know, order to provide the expected output to the, all the stakeholder so we have our uh, panelist uh, who is uh, really experience in this area so i would like to invite uh, uh, sairi sumitarachi engineer sairi sumitarachi so what i want to know sairi uh, you know you have covered a wider spectrum of uh, building automation system starting from designing implementation testing commission and even handing over uh, phases covering those entire sp uh, entire spectrum so uh, what are the challenges uh, basically you faced uh, during this each stages as a as a technical person as a person who went into the site uh, with this all the screwdrivers and cables and everything the person who fixed them what are the challenges you face uh, especially uh, providing this uh, expected output uh, to the end user and all the stakeholder as an engineer in the ground uh, thank you mr yes first of all uh, i would like to thank iesl for inviting me for this uh, to join this panel discussion uh, so answering your question uh, i think the panelists before me discussed heavily about uh, the building owners perspective about uh, the bms uh, i'd like to touch upon how the mep service uh, service providers are seeing the bms so uh, what are the challenges that i had trying to fit in uh, so when it comes to mep service providers uh, from the perspective of the bms i recognize two types of stakeholders uh, one set are the uh, uh, contractors that the bms is dependent on the other Uh, one is the contractors that are dependent on bms for an example uh, 
the BMS, as we discussed, in, integrates a lot of third-party systems like HVAC, electrical, plumbing, fire alarm system, lift system, etc., etc. Et so the BMS is highly dependent on such third-party systems. So unless the third-party system designs are finalized, it is extremely difficult for the BMS to move forward. Uh, but then because of this delay, there is a inherent delay of the BMS system because of this high dependability. Because of this delay, the second type of st stakeholders who are dependent on the BMS are being affected. Uh, as an example, say uh, the structured cabling system contractor of the project uh, is waiting for the BMS to uh, specify on the data point a requirement for the BMS or the conduit contract is waiting for the shop drawings from the BMS. So uh, this uh, continuous uh, delay or the lag from the BMS side is sometimes seen uh, from the MEP side service providers uh, sometimes as a hassle probably because uh, at, at times we are uh, delaying the progress of a lot of contractors as well. Uh, then the next challenge I have uh, faced uh, in my career is that the scope of the BMS has to be properly defined at the very early stages as well. Uh, in my experience, the BMS tender is probably the last tender to be floated in a project because it's, it, it's the last thought that comes. Uh, but the scope or the provisions that we require from the third party systems has to be specified in the third party tenders itself. Because if not, if the provisions, the interfaces are not properly defined at that stage, it is extremely difficult to coordinate at the execution level. Uh, even if, if such uh, provisions are not provided from the third party uh, contractors, it might affect the client because he will have to uh, later uh, take it up as a variation cost. And uh, again, if the MEP equipment are delivered to site without the provisions and uh, such uh, alterations are not things that can be done at site level, then the BMS will have to, this, that particular scope will have to be removed from the BMS. As an example, in one of my projects, uh, the BMS provision required for, from the meter supplier was not specified. So uh, there was a lot of discussion on how to uh, get around this problem. But then later the client had to give a variation order to the meter supplier. In another similar project, the water meters delivered to the site was not compatible to be integrated with the BMS. So the entire scope was removed from, from the BMS. So that is cutting down on the employer's requirement. So these things can be avoided by uh, considering the BMS at the very early stage itself. And then the next thing is uh, the awareness from uh, the third party system providers regarding uh, the requirements of the BMS are not adequate, I, I feel at times. Uh, say the terminals might be provided for BMS, but it's not provided in the way that we want it to be provided. So. Uh, simple awareness, uh, uh, being more aware of the existence of BMS uh, in a project uh, will be beneficial. Uh, so these requirements have to be pre-planned at the very early stage at the tender level itself. And uh, all stakeholders has to be made aware of it uh, about the need to integrate with the BMS. And it has to be considered as an important part of the building. Sometimes it's... Uh, not considered as a priority in my uh, experience. I agree. Yeah, and uh, I would I would like to prompt another question. Like, uh, especially these are the challenges that you are facing, especially during the implementation stage. But uh, sometimes I feel like when it's come to the commissioning stage also, we merely check the cable connectivity, whether the equipment they are, uh, whether it's giving the reading and all. But uh, we are not diving into the little deep whether whether things are you know, providing the expected output collectively. So mm -hmm. what is your experience uh, behind that side? Any any challenges you face? What are the challenges? Why we can't, uh, uh, coherent solution uh, cannot be implemented? Why can't we do that? Any challenges that you see there? Uh, that may be because uh, mainly, sometimes the BMS contractor will be operating on, on our own. We might be feeling that uh, our responsibility is uh, 
finishing at the point list level. That if the alarm is being shown on the dashboard, then that's it. We can wrap up and go. But uh, what I feel is it's the BMS contractor's responsibility is much higher to make sure that the employer's requirement is met and uh, that uh, the data that we have, we have a lot of data inside the BMS. This can be made use of, this can be uh, analyzed and uh, used for uh, further uh, decisions, further action. So the BMS contractors response, has a responsibility, I think, uh, to, uh, to, as you said, to dive deep and find uh, uh, various actionable uh, things as well. Thank you, Sairi. Wonderful. And uh, I really appreciate the fact that, uh, you know, the initial coordination and before ordering the equipment, you have to make sure that uh, all the components are coming with the required interface because we have to understand the fact that, as uh, Mr. Indradeva highlighted, that building automation system doesn't have any working component. It doesn't have any equipment, actually. It has that nerve system. It has that brain which will govern, which will control the rest of the yeah. devices. So this is a cardinal factor we have to understand uh, before we get into the subject even. So if the devices and the components are not having request or required interfaces, definitely uh, all stakeholders of the building automation system, including the facility owner, will be in difficulty, difficult scenario. So thank you very much, uh, Sairi, highlighting those factors. So now, so far during this discussion, we have learned uh, how the building automation system industry is dynamics pertinent to Sri Lankan contest, as well as we saw the true capabilities, especially we noted that uh, Engineer Phillips highlighted so many capabilities uh, are behind building automation system, as well as uh, uh, Engineer Sheriff highlighted that uh, what are the challenges we are facing as sales engineer and all the building uh, engineers, building services engineers or building management system engineers when we are trying to convey something to the uh, contractors or maybe consultant. So now let's see as I initially uh, slightly indicated, what are the new technologies, especially we want to know, uh, like uh, there are so many things happening, uh, cloud technology, then you get uh, uh, IoT, then obviously we do see this uh, VOIT coming in, uh, building uh, Internet of Things, those are there. And especially uh, when it's come to the IoT, you, you connect all the devices which are somewhere out there you get information through your wireless network, so on and so forth. So there are a lot of security aspects are coming in. So I would like to invite again, um, uh, Philips, back to the discussion. Uh, would you mind sharing these new technologies again uh, with us, especially in terms of this cloud technology, in terms of this uh, IoT technology? Because building automation system, based on my uh, personal idea, is merging into this sector as well. It's, it's merging, it's uh, combining with this uh, new modern technologies rapidly. So would you mind uh, telling us what are the developments happening out there bringing, while bringing some example from the global arena? Yeah, sure, sure. Oh, yeah, thanks again. Um, so we, we as a BMS manufacturer, I mean, we can say that the technology is of course already very much advanced, but um, as I mentioned previously already, it's a very conservative market. So you don't see that technologies so often yet within the buildings. Um, I mean, I would like to separate this part basically in what happens within the building. I mean, what we were talking about wireless technologies as well as what's happening outside of the building. Then we're talking about cloud-based systems, BIoT systems, as well as proper IoT platforms. So um, within the building, basically most importantly is of course that we get a connection to a building. So therefore, of course, we need uh, 4G, 5G networks within a country basically to get connection to that building. And um, whenever we have a connection to that building, of course, the main focus number one is always the security. Uh, security needs to be given. And therefore we as a manufacturer, of course, we design our products these days as security by design. That means we come on our controllers with uh, built-in firewalls, um, built-in VPN clients, that these devices as such already are fully protected. Um, furthermore, we can see a move from the, um, from the BACnet Building Automation Controls Network, which will have a major release next year, which is uh, BACnet Secure. So currently, um, the current BACnet revision basically will be totally revised, and um, there will be totally new BACnet stack basically coming up, which we as a manufacturer need to implement in our products. 
And uh, this new BankNet stack, basically, which is called BankNet Secure, brings already also this uh, given um, security features within the BankNet network. Um, so this shows basically that the, the whole industry, the whole market is moving in that direction. Um, furthermore, in the building, we can see that wireless technologies are moving quite fast um, um, ahead. So we do have wireless sensors these days. Um, in the past, we, we worked with an ocean as wireless sensors. But an ocean was the first step, basically, from, from the sensor manufacturer to come up with, with wireless devices. These days, we're talking about LoRa. LoRa, LoRaWAN, it's a very interesting protocol um, where lots of new devices are coming up. There are more than 300 applications these days, which can be done through LoRa. Um, for example, we also have our, our CO2 sensor, which is a yeah, CO2 uh, light, basically which shows you the CO2 concentration in the room, which was developed due to Corona, basically to monitor the CO2 concentration in the room. And this device is connected via LoRa uh, wirelessly with our BIoT platform. And this shows basically that uh, there are lots of new developments, new applications on the, si on the sensor side through that wireless technology, also especially for retrofit markets. Um, actuators, we can see. Yes, Philip. Yes, that's what I wanted to talk about. Now you highlighted this wireless sensor. That's something remarkable. And how, if if you get a sensor on wireless basis, how does it get power on on its own? Because anyway, if you want to transmit the signal, you need some sort of power sources. Uh, that, that's that's interesting part about these uh, new um, protocols. They consume very little energy, so they are battery operated, and the battery they last normally up to ten years. Um, those sensors and um, that's the interesting part about this wireless technologies so you don't need any power supply on those sensors you can of course get power supply but you don't need it and they can be operated for up to 10 years through two small batteries um, so would you like to add something about actuators as well yeah sure on the actuator side we can see it as well that actuators these days um, i mean previously of course actuators uh, were connected through low level and they're moving now towards bus uh, operated actuators so based on BetNet mstp or modbus rtu uh, and now actuators are already IP-based. So we can see IP-based actuators, IP-based EIV controllers. For example, Belimo is coming up with a new EIV controller, which is IP-based, and which is also connected straight to the Belimo cloud. And also these devices are then basically operated through PoE, power over ethernet. Um, so these are all developments basically, which are say, happening on the, on the field level side, on the building. Um, on the controller side, um, we as a manufacturer, of course, we also come up with new products. Um, controllers, as I mentioned already, they are also now designed uh, with security by design. And uh, the controllers as such, they're moving further towards the edge. Uh, edge means uh, they're moving somewhere in the space between the building and any cloud infrastructure. And um, they don't need that high um, um, capacity anymore on the controllers, since uh, a lot of that um, yeah, capacity is basically moving towards the cloud. So cloud-based systems are basically now executing whatever um, the algorithms uh, um, yeah, will say. And the controller on site is basically only used as a backup. Um, that's where we can see the market is heading these days. So this yes, is... uh, again, Philip, sorry for disturbing again. Now, sure. since when you get this, all the sensors and actuators in the ground, and you don't see the controller within your premises, and you you get your wireless network to pump all the data, all the position data, all the temperature readings, and everything towards uh, your uh, cloud through the wireless network. So I'm coming to the first point again. So once you do that all, so how about the security level? Can someone interpret, uh, can someone intervene from uh, outside as an intruder and violate these all? So I think we have to pay very big attention on the security side of uh, these aspects once you make everything wireless. So yeah. uh, would, you, would you highlight it again a little bit further, please? Yeah, sure, sure. I mean, this is of course for us as manufacturers, priority number one, uh, the security. Uh, it always needs to be given. That's why our products, of course, come uh, with security by design, we say these days. So everything is built around security um, on, on those products, which come with built-in firewalls, VPN clients on the products, for direct access to these devices, the connecting through or uh, communicating through HTTPS, as well as MQTT, um, which is also then, of course, a protocol uh, from the IoT world, which we are using to communicate with these devices. And um, it's everything built basically around security these days. And, there will be uh, still a controller on site um, as we see it in the next definitely five to 10 years. But uh, at one point, as you mentioned already, uh, there won't be probably any controller on site anymore. It's all basically based somewhere in the cloud. So um, yeah, these are developments we can see basically which are happening 
on the building. Um, but for me personally, the, the more interesting part is basically happening outside the building. And there we're talking, as you mentioned already, about um, yeah, BIoT platforms, building IoT platforms, um, where we can see, of course, we as, uh, as manufacturers come up with, with these kind of platforms. But there are also a lot of startups these days which come up, which have smart ideas and which come up basically with, with smart platforms um, these days to yeah, basically improve more maybe the energy efficiency of the building or the thank you uh, the yes yeah, the uh, most interesting uh, line i captured out of your whole explanation was in the in the future all the con all the controlling and most interesting part would happen out of the building while you are accommodating all the sensors and actuators within the house uh, all the interesting part the miracle will happen out of the building so something really interesting i think uh, uh, everybody's attention uh, was taken uh, out of that line. I did thank you very much. And now I do see it's getting a little bit complicated here. So you get your sensors within the house and uh, your controllers and everything, concept algorithm will be running somewhere out. So definitely we need a lot of education, a lot of training and education would definitely be needed to provide people who can do these things in the ground level. So I would like to get uh, engineer Sharif uh, Ibrahim here again, uh, how the technical education should be uh, curtailed, should be arranged in order to cater this uh, requirement, especially the training requirement, education requirement of the industry. How should we shape it? Can we go with our traditional educational system in order to cater the uh, demand arising in the engineering sector? especially building services engineering sector when this all the changes happen. Oh. You have to unmute. Yeah, it's okay now. Can you hear me? Uh, uh, I would call um, our generation, from generation from here would be third generation of engineers and the technicians. What we saw is like second and first generation, first generation, so old one in between generation for us, and then now the future generation. They must rely on the te technology um, training and education. Of, of course, every manufacturers have their own training modules for every stakeholders. The problem these days are like uh, the stakeholders get only the basic training and then uh, they do try to do things themselves. So uh, the where I work, we oversee this uh, very long ago. And what we have done is like we provide them a training then uh, we created our own uh, libraries where all the programs and the complex algorithm were pre-built and uh, the engineers, they can use this and they will be in line with our technical support team if they have any doubts or some questions. So they don't want to build everything from the scratch. It's all technology is already there and the program or the complex algorithm is already built with the highest uh, energy save efficient concepts and all the technology has been uh, implemented. So this is one way of approach. And another way is, of course, we have to follow a few guidelines like ASHRAE, backnet organization, of course, uh, guidelines from the control manufacturers. Um, then these days, there are a lot of contents available in the, in the, in, on the internet. So there are many things we can self-taught. Many things come from the experience. And uh, yeah, we, we, it's not always, uh, we see that we will always get a 20 years experience, the BMS person or the um, BMS uh, technician. Uh, we will not be always having that. So um, there are many, many resources available over the internet and all these things and many things we can self-taught and uh, we have to see ourselves how we can make this building more and more efficient applying a proper um, algorithms, proper control strategies. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sharif. Uh, definitely, uh, we may have to consider a lot on uh, education aspects of uh, building automation system once we amalgamate this, all the new technologies like uh, BIoT and then uh, 5G technology, cloud technologies are there. Definitely, we have to reshape this educational system so that we can provide the engineers, we can provide the consultant, we can provide the technician uh, for the market, for the industry, um, where the demand is there. So thank you very much, Sharif, for sharing those all thoughts. Now, we have covered a, a wide spectrum so far when it's come to the building automation system, especially covering the Asian market. And I also noted uh, 
Philips highlighted so many new developments uh, that are happening out there. So I would like to uh, come back to him again uh, because we want we are so eager to learn these uh, new technologies and new advancement happening out there. So my 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 first question, but uh, how do we map them into our Sri Lankan uh, situation here? Because our Sri Lankan market, any market behave on its own way. Engineering, engineering requirement, it has its own dynamics. So let me highlight one, one point here, uh, especially now if you consider the Sri Lankan construction industry, we do see a lot of buildings uh, coming in, but apartment buildings are flourishing. Almost all the uh, investors would like to invest at least some portion of their uh, capital on uh, apartment industry. And sometimes we get uh, little buildings also, you know, the people, especially the building owners would come to us, they would say, I have a moderate building, not that tall. And can I have building automation systems uh, in my building? But what I do see there is that most of the products are not that flexible in order to cater their requirement. Sometimes when you get the software course, it's sometimes probably, you know, they can buy another building because software cost is very high, you know, compared to the overall cost. So what is your opinion? My, my first question is, uh, how we neglected this small scale uh, entrepreneurs or building owners when it comes to building automation system? Would this new technology can cater this market as well? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, well, I mean, you have, you have to see where, where I mean, the building automation or building management systems, where they come from. Of course, they come from big four, big five guys, basically, which have developed the systems mainly for, for large scale buildings, large office towers, uh, shopping malls, um, the healthcare sector for big hospitals, of course. And um, that's where initially this, the systems come from. But um, these days, of course, we, we as, manufa as manufacturers also uh, cover smaller buildings or smaller scale applications. So that's why on the hardware side these days, um, controllers are rather flexible, you can say. And also the, the trend is going towards uh, small scale systems, small applications. As we see it, for example, in buildings, we, we have, for example, for each room, these days a dedicated controllers for room control, which basically conducts certain tasks within the room. Um, let's say, for example, the hotel room as an example. So um, we as manufacturers, we, we do move in, in, in that direction. This is definitely a, a trend we can see. Um, and for, for my personal feeling, it's often because it's still often misunderstood how a proper system can work also for smaller buildings. And you have to see basically what benefits the system brings towards the building in terms of energy savings and eventually also, and of course, it saves uh, energy costs for the owner or investor of that building. So that's why. Uh, 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 yeah, Philip, uh, so one uh, time for me. Um, but especially now when it's come to this new new advancement like IoT, BOIT and all. Now you have one platform somewhere out there. So your software is already there. So yeah. when it's come to the current BOQ of a building automation system, the biggest single line component is the software. So that's why I articulate that question in that way. Uh, now, in, in IoT platform, it's, it's uh, you know, the software is already there. It's some, it is not within your building premises. So will that answer the question of this uh, small uh, facility owners? Uh, because now they don't have to bear the entire software cost because it's already there. So only the algorithm and everything, uh, you know, controlling part, control algorithm in implementation would be the only thing remaining with them. So uh, what, what is your opinion on that? It, it, def it definitely helps um, because first of all, as a building owner, you don't have to invest in a, in a proper server, which is installed basically within a building where your, all your systems are running. Uh, you don't need any backup systems or whatever software you need basically to run that server, which you don't need because everything is basically hosted towards the cloud. And um, systems within the cloud are often very scalable. So you can start actually uh, with, with very small applications. Um, for example, as a BMS system, you can start already with 100 data points, basically scale up the system towards the data points you need. So uh, therefore, I would say definitely these new technologies help us um, or the industry to also adapt BMS systems to smaller scale buildings. So thank you, thank you. Wonderful, uh, wonderful, uh, Philip. Uh, now, uh, Let's get back to our country again. What is happening uh, in, in Sri Lanka? Uh, especially, I want to know uh, 
from uh, engineer Sayuri. Uh, again, um, now, as we understood so far, as building automation, engineer building services, engineer building management system, uh, engineers, uh, we have a huge responsibility in order to meet the requirement of these all the stakeholders. End of the day, you are the person who has to get your MEP contractors to the line. You have to meet the requirement of the client. So you will be this intermediate person who are uh, linking these all the uh, parties in between. So what I want to know is, uh, are we doing any uh, mistakes, I would say, I don't know whether that word is more appropriate, but are there any lapses in this whole design process which might curtail the real benefit to the end user here? Are we uh, in, intentionally missing out anything due to some time issue, due to some financial issues? So that end of the day, the suffering party would be the uh, building owner. Is there anything, uh, anything that you have uh, noted or anything that you would like to highlight as an engineer who had gone through this all the phases in the field? Sorry, over to you, yes. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, I wouldn't uh, necessarily call them lapses or intentional mistakes or anything of that sort, but I will highlight a couple of things that are important to be uh, considered when designing or implementing a VMS. Uh, first, point first I would like to uh, highlight on the importance of sensors and valve selections. Uh, when selecting control valves, uh, there might be a tendency to select control valves based on the pipe size or go for one size down pipes, uh, one, one size down uh, valve sizes. But uh, the correct way of selecting uh, valves is uh, considering parameters like valve authority. So these things are known, of course, but if the project is small, maybe there is a tendency to skip things like this. Uh, so the importance is uh, if the valve is not uh, correctly selected, you might be ending up with an oversized valve. Uh, that oversized valves will be operating near to closed conditions all the time, not giving you a better controllability of the uh, chilled water. And if you're selecting an undersized valve, that will require more pumping energy and will add up to the energy cost of the building. So that is an important factor to be considering. And then when it comes to sensor selections also, uh, sensors has to be selected uh, based on the uh, parameters of the AC system or the system that you're measuring. Uh, say for an example, when you're, if you're selecting pressure sensors for a fire protection system, uh, pressure ranges of each pipe is different. Uh, for, pipe, for a pipeline with 700 uh, kilopascals, you will need a zero to 1000 kilopascal sensor, while the, uh, the pipe that is feeding the landing valves are pressurized at 2200 kilopascals. For that particular pipe, you will need a sensor uh, that's reading zero to 2500 kilopascals. The reason is you can be using one type of sensor for all uh, locations, but then you are uh, not uh, you are limiting your reading to one one small portion and the small changes in the system cannot be detected if you are not utilizing the entire measuring uh, range. Uh, this is what we call the sensitivity of the sensor. Then, of course, uh, one when we are implementing the system, one uh, lapse that can occur uh, is the third party provisions on uh, AC pipes. Uh, we have to be vigilant and uh, at the very early stage itself, uh, we have to inform uh, to the MVAC contractor about the sockets that are required on pipes, the flanges, flange sizes that, that are needed and where are the locations. So these have to be informed in the form of installation drawings. For an example, uh, just showing the location for a temperature sensor on the pipe is not sufficient. Uh, you might think the AC contractor knows, but, uh, but as the BMS contractor, we know best that we need uh, a 45 degree angle uh, socket on the pipe. Uh, if you are going for flow meter installation, you need a certain uh, distance on the inlet and outlet sides to ensure smooth flow. So this kind of specific instructions, information has to be shared at the early stage itself. If the HVAC contract has already uh, planned to uh, import or fabricate the material from overseas, you're not able to uh, uh, share such information. Uh, if you share it later, then 
both parties will be in a difficult stage. Uh, if the sensors are not properly installed or not properly selected, then the readings that you are getting are not uh, accurate and then it will affect definitely on the control side as well. Uh, then the next uh, uh, issue or a challenge that comes up is that there are multiple changes required in the BMS. In the entire life cycle of the BMS, it's constantly changing. So at different stages, different parties are coming in. Uh, so the control logics or the uh, functionality of the system has to be uh, properly documented at the early stages itself and uh, shared with the necessary stakeholders to avoid confusion at a later, later stage. Uh, like you discussed, uh, then uh, for medium scale buildings also, uh, energy metering, water metering, and gas metering uh, can be carried out. We know currently in many large-scale apartments and re retail buildings, this is happening. The BMS is used to automate the billing system, but uh, it can be it can be something that uh, that can be introduced to medium-scale uh, buildings that are already existing as well. Uh, then another. Uh, in a lapse or a, uh, something that is unavoidable, I think, uh, is that the building is not fully occupied at the time that the BMS contractor is completing the commissioning. Uh, so when the building is not fully occupied, the AC system is not running on its full load. So the BMS contractor is not able to fully see the efficiency of the system to, uh, to see uh, the energy savings that are being uh, uh, contributed. Uh, so the B, there is a limit to which the BMS contractor can do. But I think my suggestion is that there is a huge responsibility uh, on the facility management team also to study this operation of the system. And uh, once the building is fully occupied, they are the ones that uh, who can uh, make the most of the BMS to make sure that the systems are efficiently operating. Like Mr. Indradeva also earlier said, the, there is a huge responsibility on the FMT. Then also there is a gap that I see at times, I have seen at times, uh, the feedback uh, from facility managers, the facility management team uh, can be used at the design stage because uh, after all, the system, BMS systems are used by the facility managers. They are the ones who know uh, what is exactly required from the BMS. Uh, so their inputs can be used, I think, at the design stage to concentrate more on what they want and to make sure that uh, uh, the ease of use is uh, better provided to the uh, operators. So these are the things that I see as uh, that can be improved upon. Thank you. Thank you, Sairi. And especially as you said, uh, there's a huge responsibility coming from the FM manager uh, in order to get the maximum out of the system. So that's a very valid point uh, for a discussion like this. Now, I would like to talk to uh, Sharif again uh, to get into a little bit uh, technical here once again. Especially now we have discussed about the controllers, we have discussed about the sensors and actuators. Those all are in place now. Uh, you have connected them, the connectivity, everything is there. But that is not the end of the building automation system. You have to tell the system how they should work collectively. So there is a bigger role when it comes to control concept. You have to implement your control concept so all the devices, all the actuators, all the sensors will work as one coherent system. But it doesn't end there. Your algorithm, your control concept would include a lot of control concept, control method like a PID controllers. There will be a lot of on-off controllers, PD controllers. So, uh, what is the importance here? How, how should we? Can we simply neglect it, or what is the attention that we should pay, especially when it comes to the commissioning stage, uh, in terms of implementing control strategies and tuning the control loop as well. Why I brought this question here is that, uh, especially like a growing market uh, that we have, it's slightly neglected. Sometimes uh, people do not 
pay enough attention on implementing the correct strategy and it doesn't end there you have to tune it correctly you implement the strategy and you have to tune it so that all the actuators will work with the required lifetime otherwise you know definitely they will fail obviously on the other hand uh, the stake uh, the the occupant will suffer so what do you think about anything that you can add there by considering global and uh, international uh, contest sheriff over to you uh, yeah um of course, uh, be it whatever your product, uh, whatever sensors you're using, uh, the main uh, heart of the system is the control strategies. Okay, the better the control strategies, better the efficiency. Um, uh, for example, um, are we making sure that our buildings are working based on the demand control ventilation? Okay, so are we having a right tamper, which is opening at the right, 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 uh, right time, and which is installed at the right place? So, um, of course, there are uh, specification as a role here. Um, again, I said it's, it's a bit old. Normally, what we see in the project is uh, you get a specification, which is very general, and then um, you leave it to the BMS persons to design uh, control strategies. And they, he designed, he put it, even without communicating with uh, MEPs, but definitely this PMS person and MEP has to sit together and MEP has to give all the inputs. What are the, say for example, one here air, air handling units, what are the fresh air intake it can take? What is the minimum? What is the maximum? What should be the design value for that to air intake? So um, all these factors has to be implemented. And uh, say for example, there are many control aspects like indoor air quality, demand control, ventilation, temperature control, pressure control. So, um, Depends upon the equipment and depends upon the you know uh, project um, uh, infrastructure or the zonal control uh, methodology which used in that project. You implement that. So um, as I said, better control strategy will bring you better uh, energy efficiency. And there are many other things like, for example, optimal start, which doesn't even you cost any money. This is optimal start module, which is not even a mechanical part, which is not even a hardware, which is not even software. It's just the coding arrangement okay so um uh, the for, for example let, let me give you an example optimal start i think uh, this is one thing when the facility manager or facility team comes in to take over the building they have to check this one first instead of going to chiller or uh, instead of going to a big air handling equipment to optimize further they have to check this because this is very simple what you have to do is like not, for example normally what happened is uh, if you're Building starts at 9 a.m. in the morning, 8 a.m. you pre-start it, like a warm-up. Okay. All of a sudden, everyone goes there, uh, someone goes there, or the schedule will be there, it will start the system and it keeps on running, running. But uh, as a warm-up, it starts like uh, the water has to flow, the valve has to open, the water, enough water has to flow, like uh, either it is cold water or the heat water, depends upon the condition of um, uh, that, that particular country. And then your fan has to run. But when you start everything, you're running a fan like for like maybe half an hour for nothing. So instead of this, how we can do this like this is like first, as a first, when the control, uh, I mean the optimum module starts, you start your valve for 25% or something, then it's it's spikes up, then it keep, it it gives the demand to the chiller to. Uh, get the fresh I mean, uh, cool, cool water. So the pump starts, the lead pump starts, then the chiller starts, then the lag pump starts staging up. It takes half an hour and all these things. Then when you get the inner flow in the chilled water pipe and you have a return temperature sensor in the chilled water pipeline, you set a target temperature for that. When that is achieved, you start your AHU. So, this brings a lot of lot of energy saving. It's, it's just unbelievable. Nobody will be touching this point. And everyone's saying we are energy efficiency guys. We do this, we do that. We optimize the solar, we optimize the HU, but there is a factor. You don't even need to invest anything. You just need to make an adjustment in the program and you, you, you get a greater deal of energy efficiency. And imagine like, for example, uh, uh, how it brings a positive impact. Like for example, in Colombo, if you may, you may have 500 buildings if everyone practices the same uh, method, how it brings, just imagine 
the, the, the amount of positive impacts it brings in the grid or the substations present at the local lo at that locality. So, yes, Philip, uh, especially uh, in terms of uh, this uh, implementing um, control strategies very much vital. I think this is the side uh, we wanted to highlight throughout this uh, uh, program also. Uh, as building management system engineers, uh, sometimes you might be sizing your uh, sensors, you might be sizing your actuators correctly, and you will get your controllers also. You might use the correct wiring, you connect them all together. But if you do not tell the controller to work them as per a predefined algorithm, predefined control steps, definitely we will not get the output. So this is a very much uh, important point that you highlighted. Thank you very much, uh, Sharif. At the same time, it has uh, same importance when it comes to the uh, control loop tuning also. Because if you get the, uh, let's say, if you are using a PID loop, you have to get the each component of the PID loop work correctly. You have to do the correct uh, timing values for these each variable. Uh, you know, you have to adjust the KP value. You have to adjust the uh, integral part, you have to arrange the derivative part so that this PID loop will work very smoothly. End of the day, the actuators will not have that much stress and your even equipment will last for very long time. So thank you very much, uh, Sharif, especially highlighting these factors. So all the building automation system engineers, all the stakeholders, all the consultants, please be vigilant this area. If you are getting into any uh, situation like that, please make sure uh, you are design your system uh, tuned correctly and it has correct algorithm as well. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for your contribution. Uh, at the same time, I have to highlight to the audience that uh, our team is uh, very much ready to answer your questions. So if you have any question, please uh, type it in uh, Zoom uh, chat box. Um, definitely, uh, we will uh, be answering them uh, after the main program. Our team is very much eager to answer these all the questions. So um, my invitation goes to all the uh, members in the audience. Please keep on putting your question in the chat box. So, and I missed out one point uh, before, uh, Sharif. Uh, I will, but I will give, maybe we'll have one minute or two minutes there. Especially uh, apartment industry is considered. Uh, what is your recommendation to us? Especially what is your invitation? Uh, how to have this uh, new technologies? and a new development uh, integrated to apartment buildings. Sorry, I, I missed that question. Yeah, I saw that. I thought, I thought you have a time, uh, no. Uh, <laughs> that's why time problem, that's why. Anyway, um, apartment buildings uh, in Middle East, it's been already implementing. Um, I think I was, so I've seen a project which is in 2011, it's already implemented uh, building management system successfully. Very normal apartment with split AC may not be feasible, but apartment with some standards, yes. We can implement like those apartment will be having rooftop units, exhaust fans, various pumps like uh, firefighting, submersible irrigations, many other electrical systems like MDB, SMDB. All these things can be monitored. Then corridor and external lightings, corridor ACs can be monitored and controlled as well. Especially and the meters like energy meters, water meters, PT meters, uh, and the gas meters. Everything can be uh, monitored and also these these data, so these values can be sent for further analysis. Also, uh, like if you have a concept of energy bill for each tenants, you can have a solenoid, solenoid valve in between. When they are not paying the bill, you can cut off. That's uh, another benefit for the owner. Also, these buildings comes up with the car parks. So you can have a car park ventilation system, which can be controlled through the BMS. Um, additionally, like tropical countries in uh, like Sri Lanka, you can have rainwater harvesting, what rainwater harvest, BMS can do with rainwater harvesting is like it can monitor, it can, um, monitor the level of the tank, it can control the valve, it can um, check the quality of water and then it control the valve whether it is to be supplied to the tenants or not, it can decide that BMS can decide. That. So these things uh, can be implemented. Uh, so this is again depends upon uh, the size of the building, how uh, uh, how standardized it is, like what are the equipments inside to make it feasible. Right, uh, thank you. Thank you, Philip. So definitely uh, uh, our 
apartment uh, buildings uh, can definitely be benefited uh, out of this uh, building automation system. So if any consultant or any stakeholder who are investing on uh, apartment buildings, definitely I, we have to highlight that uh, there are a number of benefits that you can gain out of uh, these systems. So I would like to come back to uh, engineer Mr. Indra Deva again. Uh, uh, what, what are the, especially um, from operator's point of view, um, are we missing out anything uh, which might curtail the real benefit of uh, building automation systems? Uh, as the operator, what's the responsibility they are? Because you have a great deal of experience as the FM facility manager of uh, one of the largest buildings in Sri Lanka. So yeah. in order to get the best out of the system, what should we do? Or are we missing out anything there, sir? Okay, I think Jagat, um, operation is only one side of the equation. The other side is uh, if you want to operate a building efficiently, you have to build it efficiently. Otherwise, there's no way you can operate without having proper tools and equipment. So now, uh, most of the developers are quite uh, educated and knowledgeable. They are aware, uh, if you take a large commercial building, uh, more than 50% of the operating cost is energy. All your MEP systems are consuming energy. And energy, in turn, will consume money. So then if you're operating, more than 50% of your operating cost is ener uh, energy, then we need to be serious about the management of all, of all our building services. So then this process has to start at the very beginning. Because the same developer will have the operators to manage the building. So then uh, during the uh, discussion, uh, I, I uh, came across a few points that, uh, and there was a comment about, I think, uh, Sheriff mentioned that building service, building management system is invisible. It cannot be seen. And when it comes to budget uh, constraints, this is one of the things that you uh, used to chuck it off. And then from Sayuri that I learned that the difficulties of integrating with the other building services and MEP system. So we have to ask the question why it is happening like that. Right? We have to resolve that. If you want to resolve it, resolve it at the very beginning. Right? The most of the developers, now they have operators, the owner's project requirement. So instead of, in addition to mentioning the performance of the individual equipment, for example, he will say, I want a chiller with 0.52 kilowatt per ton. He will say at the same time, I want my HVAC system to operate at 0.95 kilowatt per ton, that is both water side and air side, minus 20%. Right? So then the designers need to get together and design a system that can operate at 0.95 kilo per ton minus 20%. Otherwise, you won't get the LEED certification or the green mark certification or any other certification as an efficient building. So when that is highlighted in the owner's project requirement, the designers will be compelled to get all the other support uh, designers or the consultants, mainly the building management consultant or the building management service provider to incorporate all their requirement into the design. Right? If you just mention the efficiency of one particular equipment, let's say pumps over 90% efficient, you can buy pumps from anywhere. But if you say my chill water pump has run at 0.5 kilowatt per ton, then you need to integrate into your BMM. Then you need to have an algorithm as uh, we did mention, uh, otherwise you cannot achieve this uh, overall performance. So then I think if you want to avoid these difficulties of diminishing of BMS during the uh, design stage, we need to address it at the very beginning by convincing the developers and building owners. Right? Once the uh, building is designed with a proper building management system, I'm again thinking, can we think of a person without a central nervous system and a brain? Of course you can't, right? So similarly, a large building cannot be built or cannot be operated without a building management system. So it has to be a must. So if we think that it is getting missed out during the design or we have uh, concerns uh, during the uh, installation, so that is something to do with the conceptual stage design. So then if you take it at the very beginning, uh, if you put in all the requirements, performance requirements of the building into the owner's project requirements, then definitely 
this most of these issues will be will diminish right and coming back to your operational question yes i think one issue is that uh, our building services or technical people who are managing building they should realize their their job is not to run equipment their job is to run equipment efficiently and effectively so provide whatever the service requested required by their end users or the customers or the occupant and at the same time give that service at the minimum cost so there are many benchmarks available to measure whether your facility is operating at the optimum level for example energy efficient indices and the building services engineers or the uh, building managers should be aware of this performance criteria of building then once you are aware then you will realize there is no way i can run this building without a bms so then at the very beginning the developer has highlighted to all the designers you guys get together and design a building that can perform like this and then you get uh, your designers to do so during the construction it's very important that you need to get your operation staff involved in the construction at least about good 8 to 10 months before the completion so they will born and bred with the building they will go through all the installations they will go through all the testing commissioning and then handover and they are aware of the performance criteria performance capabilities of the building so when it comes to operation so this building is no more a stranger to them they are is part of their life so then they should be able to run the building more effectively this is one area that we are lagging we don't get our operation staff during the construction at least good 6 uh, to 8 months before the completion i think this way we can i think uh, get it of avoid most of these uh, pitfalls and have a smooth uh, design from the concept stage all the way to the operational and then finally we can have a well performing building thank you uh, thank you very much uh, mr deva for sharing those thoughts with us especially uh, for the expected outcome the best outcome uh, we have we know that the huge responsibility at the end of the day is with the operators the, the people who are using these things uh, with that uh, now we are coming to the end of the session but uh, i want to get uh, very important uh, view points from you all now we discuss about so many technologies we discuss about the challenges um, in sri lanka that uh, we have especially implementing building automation system now i need uh, some advices from you uh, first uh, i would like to uh, get uh, engineer philips on board for this question uh, do you think that uh, sri lanka has all the skills and capabilities especially the infrastructure in order to get this all the new modern technologies that are flourishing out there or oh, how should we be careful when you are picking them to our market when we are picking them into the our market any advice from you especially considering uh, the rest of the market especially in asia because you have some exposure in the uh, asian market any advice that you can give us yeah sure um i mean the technology is there it just needs to be adopted basically and it's, uh, it's for me a process of of learning and education first of all for the investors as well as for the developers they need to understand the systems and the benefits of all systems and um secondly more important which we can see from countries like singapore you need the government to to step in or less to come with new policy policies new mandates um to implement such systems uh, within those within the country and singapore for example from the sgbc there's a mandate that all buildings needs to implement data loggers for their chiller plants as well as in the future for their hus to measure the efficiency of these systems and um this basically helps um more or less as a developer and as a owner to understand the efficiency of a building and therefore also to reduce the energy consumption of those buildings so um so for me uh, two most important steps are first of all education and training for the yeah people on ground as well as the government needs to step in basically with certain policies certain uh, um, incentives to uh, make it more attractive for the building owners and investors to invest in such, such systems so uh, philips and now uh, you highlighted this uh, one particular aspect especially training and uh, education will play a major role on the other hand you discussed about new advancement and technologies happening now if i rearticulate another question in order to be a 
modern building automation engineer, what are the skills, what are the knowledge that we should acquire uh, to, in other way, to retain in this market? What should we learn on immediate yeah. base? Yeah, so I mean, what we can see basically is that the, the IT world and the building automation world, they're, they're merging together. In the past, you had basically your IT engineers, uh, which basically they took care of all the IT infrastructure and you had the BMS engineers. And uh, these days, basically, the two worlds are merging together. So as a BMS engineer, you need uh, like advanced knowledge from IT systems, how IT systems are operated. And um, yeah, that's basically where we can see the trend, where, where the market is heading. So more and more IT knowledge needs to be absorbed by BMS engineers these days. Yes, so as per your perspective, I don't think uh, we'll have that many challenges in our country also in order to uh, acquire these all the technologies as well, as well as to implement in this soil as well. So thank you very much. At the same time, um, I would like to get uh, Sheriff again uh, to get his view on uh, any advice uh, because you highlighted uh, one factor there that our specification very much outdated, especially you are highlighting about the specification in Middle East. If, if that is happening in Middle East, definitely uh, we would also be lagging here. So uh, what, what is your advice, especially for the consultant and uh, engineers uh, to get this technology correctly to our country so that all the stakeholders will be benefited at the end? Sherry, over to you. Uh, yeah, um, of course, uh, we all need to update our skills based on the trend which industry is moving towards. We cannot lag behind. There is a, a huge uh, demand for the IP controllers which should be implemented. Specification has to be listed that and all the new technologies and also for call for security because everything goes IoT, everything connected. So calls for the security within the hardware itself, the control side itself. So these are all to be mentioned in the specification. Um, also, uh, the problem with the uh, consulting firms, like they don't keep a particular specialist to inspect the system. Yeah. Sometimes you see uh, uh, some of the engineers, okay, it's not, not background, even not from the electrical or mechanical, comes to validate the system, which is BMS, and uh, end up having uh, some comments, which is uh, not so related. The problem here is like, for example, I don't like the color of the graphics, you change the color. Maybe that kind of a comment he will get the commissioning engineers or the guy who is uh, attending the inspection. The problem with this is uh, what that commissioning engineer takes over from that to his next project. He done uh, like three, four months of hard work commissioning, fine tuning everything, uh, calibrating the sensors to make it optimum uh, working conditions. Then uh, in the end, someone evaluate, you don't go deep into the control logics, how it works, how whether the functionality is, uh, working properly based on the requirement, nothing is checked, just uh, comments on the bay, uh, on, the, on the graphics and then went, went away means that commissioning engineer, for, when, he, when he goes to the next project, what he takes over from that is like, he learned that, okay, I can get past this inspection if my graphics are beautiful. So you only concentrate on the, start concentrating on the graphics and the real things maybe will not put that much concentration. So the quality of his next project also, is self-learning will decline. So uh, okay. yeah. everyone here has to, you know, upscale their skills, move towards the trend what we have at the moment, and uh, reflect that in the specification on the tender documents. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Sheriff. Especially uh, as you understood, definitely we can uh, benefit out of this. Uh, building automation system, if we get our document correctly, if, our, if we update our specification and definitely if we uplift our uh, the skills and uh, knowledge as well. So thank you very much uh, for those input. Now I would like to uh, get back to Sayuri again, especially uh, any advice Sayuri for our young budding engineers uh, who are there, uh, who can uh, shape their interaction with this industry so that end of the day, as a country, all the uh, stakeholders will be benefited out of this technology. Any advice that you can tell us? Sorry, I was muted. Uh, so yeah, uh, I would like to start uh, from the basics. 
uh, that is uh, more than 50% of the problems in a BMS uh, project is uh, due to cable identification issues. So I want to go back to basics saying that you should not forget uh, the importance of tagging all equipments, all panels, all controllers, all field devices, all the cables that all the cable cores that you are terminating on each side, on the panel side, on the field devices side, on the third party panel side, all of this should be tagged. The smaller the project, I feel, the bigger the headache because you are going to skip all of that. You are going to think uh, it's uh, not as important, but there are uh, so many cables that are being pulled in BMS. So it's very easy to get confused and uh, the entire uh, uh, the execution cycle will get a big mess if you forget to do the basics. Uh, then also going one step ahead, uh, I propose to have a detailed termination schedule. The normal, the, the termination schedule that we use uh, consists of each point and then where the programmed address and uh, maybe the termination point. But going beyond that, uh, I propose to have a termination schedule that has a lot of detail that will include uh, the termination on the field device side, on what is the cable that you're using, what is the core that has to be terminated, where it should be terminated. And most importantly, the 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 tag that you have to use, the technician has to use, use when they are pulling the cable. Because we all know that when uh, the laborers are pulling cables on site, that what they're doing is putting one, two, three, four, or just uh, cutting some, uh, 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 making some marks on the cables. Uh, so at the end of, uh, at the end, when you're going to terminate, it becomes, a, becomes an entire mess. So it's important in the termination schedule itself to uh, give what is this uh, the tag to be used during cable pulling. And then, of course, your final labeling should also be included in this. And all this labeling should match from the shop drawing to the GA drawing to the SLD, panel SLD, to the label at site, to the as built. All of this should be matching and it will always make your life more easier. The time that you're going to save is a lot more and you can be concentrating the engineer can be concentrating more on important things how to tune the bms in other aspects of the building then the next thing is uh, the electricians that we are working with are not much familiar with bms uh, they are they might be good, good in the field of electrical engineering but uh, but when it comes to bms they are new to this so uh, and most electricians technicians that we are using are from the electrical background and they do not have the necessary expertise in handling mechanical system fittings. So as an example, uh, if you use an electrician to uh, fit sensors on a pipeline, the more chances are that the sensors are definitely going to be leaking at, when the system is pressurized. Uh, so to avoid such uh, uh, pitfalls, some level of prior training for the labor force will be helpful if that's something like that can be looked into. Uh, then, uh, of course, uh, the to have better coordination with the MEP services. If the MEP services are much more aware about the existence of the BMS in a project, it would make uh, both our lives much easier. I think, uh, say for an example, uh, the electrical DBs come with one gland plate mostly. So when the BMS contract is coming in, mostly the electrical cables would have been terminated. And it's not possible to remove the gland plate to make a sleeve for the BMS cables to go in. But if the electrical contract is aware about the BMS existence, then uh, that person can uh, be can make a sleeve for BMS so that uh, at the latest stage, both of us will not be facing difficulties. Uh, another example is uh, there are water meter metering and gas metering in BMSs. Uh, there, the, there are pulse converters that has to be uh, installed on the meters if they are integrated to BMS. So before the system, before the gas or the water system is tested or any sort of consumption has happened, 
the pulse meter has to be installed on the meter pulse converter has to be installed on the meter because if not the manual reading on the uh, the dial will not match with the reading that is taken to the bms so this is a very big problem that we face in almost all the projects because the manual reading and the bms reading is not matching uh, so a basic level of awareness is enough to avoid such uh, repetitive mistakes, I think. Uh, then, of course, uh, it's very important at the very early stage to be sharing uh, the third party interface requirements with all stakeholders. So uh, we have uh, two sets of documents that we share. One is the point list. Point list will have the hardwired uh, provisions that are required. Uh, this will have all the interfaces that we require, whether it's a four to 20 milliampere interface or a zero to 10 volt uh, interface or a dry contact that we require that can be specified in the point list. For high level interface requirements, when you're integrating something like energy meters or gas meters, we uh, call it, we issue a document called the interface coordination document, which will have all the information such as the interface type that you want from the energy meter, the protocol, what is the ID that has to be set in each of the meters, what is the baud rate, so information like that can be shared in this uh, coordination document. If not, there will be a lot of uh, confusions and a lot of uh, 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 discussions and a lot of arguments as well uh, when you're trying to execute the project. So pre-planning is one of the key things in BMS. I agree. Uh, yeah, I have one question there. Uh, now you said uh, so many uh, things that so many protocols, I would say, so many strategies that has to be implemented in the uh, site scenario so that uh, end of the day, your job will be very easy one. What is your suggestion? Who would do that? Uh, who has to do this part? end of the day. Will you be getting this uh, entire support as you uh, highlighted here? Then end of the day, who is the one who has to do this, basically? Of course, it is uh, It is done by the BMS contractor, but uh, the, the awareness and the support from the MEP services, if provided, uh, will make our lives better. Our means in the sense the BMS contractors as well as the other third party uh, stakeholders as well. So the coordination is the difficult part, but it is something that can be streamlined, I think, if more people are aware and accepting the fact that there is a BMS in the system, in the building. Thank you. Thank you, Sairi. Especially, I think, uh, uh, end of the day, in order to get the maximum out of the system, it is very much essential that all the stakeholders, even at the execution stage, you know, work together as one team so that finally you can have a very peaceful life within the site itself as well as end of the day all the stakeholders in the site or the construction project will be benefited now uh, i would like to get another uh, answer from uh, mr indradeva especially now you are representing the user in here facility manager here so and we discuss so many new technologies definitely during the question and answering session uh, we will be having a lot of questions i'm seeing a lot of questions are popping up now, Mr. Indradeva, any advices uh, when you are picking these technologies, when you are getting these new technologies into the country, any advice for the consultant, any advice for the budding engineers, of course, finally for the contractors as well. Anything that you have to add here? Yeah, I think uh, getting new technology is always on the card. So there is no doubt that uh, we should go for new technology. Uh, at the same time, we need to realize that somebody has to pay for these things. So then the people who are spending their money to get this new technology should be convinced that they are getting benefit out of it. And it's not just a fancy thing. You need to convince the people who make their decisions to spend money to get whatever the new technology or the BMS that they get the benefit. How do you convince them? How the most of the people in this forum may be engineers. They will understand the technology. They will understand the sensors, programming, and all that. But uh, people who will be investing on that, they will understand a different language. They understand what sort of benefit that they get out of this, quantifiable benefit. And for most of the people, the common language that all, all of us can understand is rupees and cents. Right? So then the, being the engineers, designers, 
and the service providers, it is very important for us to convey this message in an understandable language to the decision maker. Right? So then, uh, for example, if you want to convince somebody, if you can bring in a case study uh, of implementation of new technology or the BMS with very clear benefits to the end user in terms of operational cost. I mentioned that the more than 50% of the operating cost is electricity or energy. So definitely a BMS is a good candidate. But how do you convince somebody? Only through a, a successful case studies, right? Limited technology involvement in the case study, but to put it in a very simple language that can be understood by the people who are investing. I think that is one area we are all lagging and we call each other engineers. I think good uh, 15 years back, I stopped calling myself engineer because I'm working for organization to resolve problems, not just as engineer. So then if you think that you are an engineer, you try to find solution from engineering terms. People don't understand, right? So then we need to convey this to a form that anybody can understand, especially the decision maker. I think that is uh, one of the advice I can give to all the engineers, the designers, and people who service providers who want to get business, right? And number two is that among the engineers, we need to develop cross-technological awareness. And the BMS service providers should understand the building services technology. This technology is changing quite rapidly. So new technology is coming into building services. And how do you put these building services together to make a building performing? Running a chiller, running a pump is a different story. But how do you convert this to a performance? Performance KPI, performance index, and show it to a person in a very simple language that you have improved the performance of the building and you have reduced the operating cost of the, cost of the building as a result of this introduction of new technology. For example, installation of a ESP for a oversized pump. Let's say 100, 120 kilowatt pump can save you about 400,000 rupees a month, which is like payback is about two and a half months. So this is a very easy language that anybody can understand. Your senior management will say, our ROI is 40%, go ahead, right? If they invest, invest that 1 million for a VSD or some in some other form, they will never get 400,000 in return as the savings. The problem is we talk about technology, we talk about VFTs, we talk about pumps, but we don't talk about the language that the other people can understand. Right? So then uh, on the other hand, get the uh, building services engineers and the designers to understand the capabilities of VM. They, need, they should realize that the equipment cannot work as a one unit to provide the necessary performance expected by the building owners. For example, now we have capable people, good people, but when you put them into a team, that will be the worst team on earth, right? Similarly, when it comes to building services, you may have world-class equipment, but if you don't have the integrated effort of this equipment, they'll be just running on their own silos and you won't get the benefit out of it. So when it comes to people, we call it teamwork, but when it comes to building services or MEP system, we call it integration. So then the building services engineers should understand this integration is required to make your building performing. So I think those are the two advisors I would like to give to the uh, community who are participating. Thank you very much, uh, Engineer Mr. Indradeva for those uh, wonderful thoughts and uh, we have come to the end of this session. Um, we have very limited time left. Uh, now, if I summarize all the aspects that we have discussed actually, especially in terms of new technologies, we noted that uh, in summary, if I uh, put them into one line, miracles are to happen out of the building that as uh, Philips highlighted, we will get all the sensors. What we, in the future, what we see within the building would be a few, sen few sensors, few actuators, but all the miracles uh, will be out of the building. So he invited us to get required knowledge, get required understanding on these all the subject areas so that we can preserve uh, our uh, signature as building services engineers in the future. But that doesn't mean we should forget uh, how our air conditioning system works, how our VAV system works, how FCU works. Those all knowledge should definitely be essential for the 
BMS engineer, but definitely he has to cover a very broad aspect in the future to be a successful uh, building automation engineer. At the same time, I should also highlight the fact that uh, having outdated uh, specification in the building automation system industry would harm every side. Like uh, contractors are struggling because even I personally know when you try to uh, combine a system, when you try to develop a system, design a system, these outdated specifications are challenging us so much. So that was uh, highlighted by uh, Sherry. Uh, thank you very much. At the same time, he also highlighted the importance of education. So definitely we have to reshape this uh, education aspect of building automation industry so that definitely we can bring this all the technologies, new advancement to our country so that all the stakeholders will be benefited as uh, Mr. Indradeva highlighted because end of the day what our investors because they are the biggest part in any industry without investors we can't move rather than you you might have a lot of development in one side uh, on, in order to bridge them your investors and this engineering should be bridged by these intermediate people so they have to use the correct language uh, in order to get uh, everyone to the same platform. So thank you very much, uh, Indradeva, Mr. Indradeva, who, uh, who highlighted these all the factors. And at the same time, even though you have this whole uh, uh, in the paper, in the document, but that doesn't mean it works. We need all the engineers to get into the ground, get into the equipment and connect the, all the cable. Otherwise it won't work because we have to get the signal uh, without any trouble, without uh, any errors. So if that doesn't happen, definitely uh, the system won't work. It will not give the expected output. So as engineer Sayuri highlighted, uh, it's very much essential you follow all the documentation, you follow all the, the strategies and the protocols, especially before integrating the protocol, BMS engineer should follow this predefined protocol so that all the uh, component, physical component will come into the same platform and it will deliver the expected out. So I'm really happy uh, the content that you have delivered here. That's the basic summary. So I would like to open the forum for all the questions, um, but I have one question and there's a, a there's a question here also which has been repeatedly highlighted and we have one uh, air conditioning expert in our panel uh, that is none other than our own chairman uh, engineer Prasanna Narang. Uh, now it was repeatedly highlighted this uh, during the discussion engineer Naranguda that uh, uh, control strategies plays a bigger role I think it's irrespective of this all the advancement, whether you go for wireless, whether you go wired connection, whether you are going with IP base or LoRa, it doesn't matter. End of the day, this all the physical component, all the chillers and chill water pumps should work as per a, uh, one some sort of control strategy. Your cooling towers should work as per some sort of a, a control strategy. So, Engineer Narangoda, would you like to share some um, thoughts and some experience uh, on combining them and giving the best out of, uh, in, sorry, in terms of energy saving, anything that you can add, engineer, person, Narangoda. Thank you, thank you, Jaga. Thank you very much. Um, this is a very good question. I think uh, uh, most uh, the, uh, panel members already touched here and there. That's all the parts of that question we already discussed, but I will specifically uh, touching upon the HVAC side of the track control, uh, how it come to BMS. Mr. Indira mentioned that the KPIs and which we can monitor the KPIs related to uh, HVAC plants, both side and air side. So to monitor, in order to get, in order to monitor that or to get that monitoring dashboard or KPI onto the BMS platform, there are some algorithms and strategies to be written in the BMS language uh, to get to that uh, KPIs. So basically, if I explain, Jagat, uh, if I tell you something like. Uh, what BMS really would do finally is to maintain the comfort conditions within the space. So there's a prime objective of any of the controlling system to make the, the occupants comfortable within a living space. So BMS is a, is a marvelous tool that you can achieve this. Uh, the comfort conditions within the space, mainly temperature and average, while maintaining your energy at a very, uh, very uh, uh, efficient level. So basically all your systems, if it is a air conditioning system that you can basically couple the controls like PID controls to run the HVAC system efficiently and effectively to maintain uh, this comfort condition within the premises while maintaining the 
the minimum amount of energy from the other side. So in order to make that integration, you, you definitely you need a proper control system like the DMS. If I take a, a few examples, how a standard a DMS would control HVAC system, is starting from the R side, from the space. Uh, you monitor your temperature in this space and your uh, variable control damp if it is a central air conditioning system. Uh, so the variable air volume damp controls the damp controls based on the space temperature, and uh, the duct pressure uh, would control uh, the blower speed based on the PID loop. The same time you're uh, modulating valve or PICV or PIBCV pressure independent balancing and control valve, which is coupled with the uh, air handling units, would control the chill water flow into all these coils based on the temperature. And finally, this, uh, this whole set of controls goes to the uh, chill water system, to the chiller and the pumps to maintain, uh, to respond the building load based on the, the demand and the chiller speeds, will, the chiller, chill water pump speed would control and the chiller will deliver the required load. Same, same uh, control will happen in the cooling, uh, the condensed water side as well, where the cooling tower speeds would control based on the ambient conditions and will provide the minimum possible cooling tower leaving temperature to the chiller to optimize the chill operation. So this standards control will definitely uh, be should couple to the HVAC system through uh, proper algorithms and PID loops get uh, a proper functionality and efficient functionality and effective operation as Mr. Engineer mentioned to get them into the final year into a proper dashboard for monitoring purposes. So that's the must. Yeah. So thank you very much Jagat for uh, asking that question, raising that question. Uh, and in addition to that, there are a lot of new technologies being tried out, which I did not mention here, but in future we might come across these uh, newer strategies, newer technologies, which we can, uh, which we can effectively couple into HVAC controls. But thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman, uh, Engineer Prasanna and Naranguda for sharing that uh, strategies, especially that's the most essential part that I wanted to repeatedly highlight this. Now I would like to give the opportunity for our audience also. There are a lot of uh, questions that are coming here, but uh, please remember we have time until uh, 9.30 only. Um, but definitely, whenever we get any chance, uh, we will uh, definitely answer your question even in the future. But I have picked a few questions out of our uh, questionnaire here. So uh, this is the question. Um, first, I will read the question and let's see who can answer. If the BMS is rejected by the client because of the cost, can't you show them the investment versus benefit on a timeline in uh, monetary terms, which people can feel very much? Don't you think that uh, you can uh, convince that way? I think uh, this question uh, automatically goes to uh, engineer uh, Indradeva Mendis. Uh, Mr. Mendis, uh, I think this is what you have answered already. Could you add a few more thoughts there? Exactly, Jagat. I have already answered this. I think and it, it's a good approach as well. And I think you have to do it before BMS get rejected. When the BMS get rejected, the people are already gone into the negative mindset and getting somebody, if somebody says no, and you make uh, to that same person to say yes, it's difficult. So before people say no, you have to highlight your, you have, you have your submission with uh, proper case studies so that uh, there will be a positive mindset right throughout from the beginning so that you will never have to do it uh, once it is rejected. So you have to do it before that with the timelines or whatever the possible uh, outcome from the BMS and that you need to convince them that you cannot run a large facility without the BMS, uh, it, it, it's a mandatory thing. And then how Thank do you, you how it can help to improve the performance? I think that Thank is you, a very, very, very correct approach. Yes, I think uh, he has mentioned that the timeline versus monitor benefit would be the ideal way of uh, highlighting that. And there are a few questions, I think, with a few terminologies. So I would like to pose this question to uh, uh, Philips here. Uh, there are a few things uh, which I want to tell. Uh, they want some sort of uh, understanding on uh, digital twin concept being used in uh, building automation system, big data analysis as well as LoRa technology. They want to know about uh, LoRa versus uh, 
IP technologies. Would you like to highlight a few thoughts there? Yeah, sure, uh, sure. I mean, yeah. digital, digital twin is currently a very big topic and uh, due to time constraints, we couldn't really cover that. So uh, basically a digital twin is also what we are using in our BIOT platform. So the digital twin is actually um, a digital copy of the physical infrastructure on site. Um, this can be already autom uh, automatically generated through so-called BIM, uh, building information modeling models. There's already some technologies basically which convert this automatically into um, a digital twin. But a digital twin often um, basically helps you to run certain algorithms on that digital twin. And the digital twin of a building can also be smarter than the actual building because you can generate virtual data points in that digital twin, which then eventually can be smarter than the actual building. And uh, a digital twin is always the basis basically to, um, yeah, to run certain uh, algorithms, new technologies, as well as yeah, AI systems on uh, this kind of BIOT platforms. So therefore the digital twin is always the foundation you can say, um, which basically um, yeah, is generated towards any of these BIOT platforms. Thank you, Philip. So anything about uh, LoRa versus IP? Um, I think it depends on the application. Um, on very critical applications, I do see that IP is gonna gonna win the race. Um, when I see, for example, I don't know, a chiller plant room, um, which is for me a very critical application in the building. Yeah, definitely um, for the for the medium term, you're gonna use IP-based sensors in the future. For certain specific applications, um, LoRa is definitely going to win because uh, they are battery operated and they are also wireless sensors um, that can be, for example, uh, leakage control, um, which is a very, very good application for such a sensor. Anything within the room, uh, temperature CO2 sensors are also going to be then also based on LoRa, um, where, we, where we see them where the market is heading. Um, so it always depends on the application, basically, where you use which, which technology. Right. Uh, thank you very much. Especially uh, LoRa means uh, low powered wide area network uh, versus IP. I think uh, that's again new concept that is to, uh, to dominate the building automation system industry. Actually, I'm left it only uh, nine minutes. Uh, now, there are lots of questions uh, appearing here. There's a very, uh, I would say, another question. Uh, what is uh, IBMS and how advantageous it is compared to traditional BMS? Share if anything that you can add there, IBMS versus uh, the ordinary BMS, because once you integrate them all together versus our ordinary building automation system, especially, can we get that benefit as we all expect? Uh, yeah, uh, IBMS may stand for either intelligent BMS system or integrated BMS system. In the end, it's a BMS. Okay, it, it, it does what X tries, it goes, it does many of the high level integrations. Yeah. Uh, on data wise, it is very good. On efficiency wise, it increases the system. Say, for example, you have a damper, which is uh, intelligent, and you have a, a, a VST, which is intelligent. Instead of wiring those, you can you know, um, 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 loop them all and bring it in the network, and you can connect it so that the value engineering there have a benefits. And this is how you do the value engineering, not removing things, just adjusting the technology. And that will reduce a lot of cost because you're reducing analog input digital output modules and some sort of cabling. So um, integrated PMS system, uh, if it is implemented in the best way, you will get uh, best out of the system for the better cost. Right, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, usually this, uh, when it's come to talking with the uh, consultant and client, uh, we always post uh, the, the the question that we are mostly encountered is the payback period. Uh, is there any proper answer for this, uh, Philip or Sheriff? Uh, what is your collective answer there? When when somebody question about the payback period after implementing the building automation system, I think even uh, engineer uh, Interdev also highlighted this part. Can we get into the real numbers? That's where most of the building automation system engineers are uh, getting uh, kind of a backward in terms of giving these numbers and percentage. Any thoughts there? I will start with Sherry first. Yeah, um, there are proven examples, uh, of course, um, in, in, of course, in the Middle East, especially in UAE, there are companies who is doing this, okay? Because what they do is they do some sort of level of auditing of all these mechanical electrical equipment based on that they make some changes uh, and uh, 
ideally what they do is the existing VM, VMS system, they make it uh, energy efficient by changing few control strategies, changing the building envelopes, changing, um, installing some VFTs. There are also, there were one project which was like, uh, I think uh, they got the payback in one year time, whatever investors. And there are different models has been applied in this in these aspects, like energy efficiency companies, like ESCO companies. What they do is they finance themselves. They go to a building, audit it, and they, they finance themselves. Whatever they saving they make, uh, they take it from there. Yeah, and they get uh, like five years um, energy saving contract. This method is there, but as a manufacturer, of course, um, um, what they do is like um, they adjust the control sequences. Again, this is not required this stage if the BMS implementation is made correct or implemented right. properly. Yeah, so Thank this you. is next stage. Uh, and normally, uh, what we say in general terms, the payback period is like uh, one to two years. This is how how it is it is set in, in general terms. I think thank you, thank you. More, more to it. Th thank you, thank you, Sheriff. And uh, I have uh, almost five minutes left. Uh, there's a question I would like to get uh, Sayuri on board uh, to answer this question. In uh, some cases, we are experiencing issues in uh, maintenance or operation operational phase, especially in troubleshooting and defect. Uh, rectification in existing system. How uh, we address uh, that kind of uh, knowledge and uh, competency gap? Because in uh, many cases, we need real-time solution to continue the operation, especially this uh, defect rectification side. Anything that you can add there? Uh, uh, but yeah, remember, we have very maybe yeah, one okay. minute or two minutes, right? right. Just, Okay, uh, so uh, as I mentioned earlier, so uh, by having proper documentation at the uh, during throughout the execution phase or execution phase will uh, be helpful for the operation team when they comes in as well. Having a proper termination schedule uh, with correct details, having proper as built drawings, and then having a, a very customized operation. Um, uh, maintenance manuals as well. And also this knowledge transfer from BMS to the BMS contractor to the FM team has to be, uh, it is a very important uh, factor, like Mr. Imza Davis earlier said, uh, if the FM team can be uh, mobilized to site uh, when the construction is ongoing, then they have some time to engage with the execution uh, team, the construction uh, contractor. And uh, uh, get more idea into how the troubleshooting can be done, the def how to tackle defects and things like that. Uh, so I think that uh, can be something uh, to look into, like the working alongside to uh, the BMS contractor. Thank you. Thank you, Sayuri. And uh, that's uh, uh, the uh, end of our session. Actually, we have uh, very few minutes left. So there are a lot of questions appearing, which means uh, we have created uh, uh, we have created a very huge interest uh, in the audience. That's why a lot of questions are appearing, but unfortunately, uh, time doesn't permit. And uh, uh, there's a huge time gap even here when it's come to uh, Philips and uh, Sheriff also, they are joining from Germany as well as uh, Sheriff uh, joining from Middle East. So we have to respect their timeline as well, but definitely uh, we are there, especially building services engineering uh, sectional committee together with IESL will always be there to answer these questions. So this is one initiation of series of program that we have planned even in the future. Please stay with us. And definitely our chairman is here, engineer Prasanna Narangud, and these all the people are there who can extend their helpful hand. Uh, and there are a lot of people who are interested in, I have seen uh, some questions saying that how to become a uh, building automation system engineer. So that's that's the interest that we have created collectively. So thank you very much, gentlemen, uh, especially uh, Philips who joined from uh, Germany, as well as Sheriff uh, joining from uh, Middle East. At the same time, Sayuri, uh, she has contributed a lot by giving real hands-on experience, as well as uh, telling us uh, how things should be done. At the same time, we should not forget the legend of building services engineering sector, that is uh, Mr. Indra Deva Mendes, who has uh, experience, uh, lots of experience in terms of uh, uh, these sectors, uh, especially using uh, building automation, so on and so forth. Finally, I would like to uh, thank uh, Building Services Engineering Sectional Committee on behalf of Building Services Engineering Sectional Committee to uh, IESL who have uh, contributed 
providing time and as well as there are a lot of people who help behind this uh, program they contributed a lot to get this uh, program running very smoothly i think everybody had a very good time uh, having knowledge uh, please uh, remember but really matters is what you have learned out of this program. We have invested a lot of time. So please use them. Whenever you get a chance, please use them. And I thank uh, our chairman, uh, engineer Prasanna Narangoda, who had been behind this program, especially uh, the secretary and the rest of the secretary um, Isuru and the rest of the people who have contributed for the success of uh, this program. So thank you very much. And we are hoping to meet again, even in the future with a similar program. Uh, with that, uh, I'm signing off. Uh, I'm Jagat and have a pleasant evening. Stay safe until we meet next time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.